Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're joining us from. And welcome to today's webinar, The Complexities of Food Allergens. My name's Amy. I'm a member of the marketing team here at the Perry Johnson Companies, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's webinar and offer technical support to our speakers. Uh, today, we're welcoming back a, a, a familiar guest that some of you may know from previous webinars we've hosted, uh, Jennifer Crandall of Safe Food and Root. Uh, but just before we get started, I want to remind all of our attendees that you will be on mute for the duration of the session just to ensure audio quality and adequate bandwidth for our presenters. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear your questions and we want to take as many as we can in the time allowed. Um, some of the most common questions we get are regarding uh, the availability of slides and whether the broadcast is being recorded. And I'm happy to say that not only will the slides be available for download from the PDRFSI website, we are indeed recording the session. So anyone who was unable to join us, or maybe you have to leave a bit early and you miss part, uh, you'll be able to rewatch with the voiceover and the complete Q&A uh, free of charge on the PGRFSI YouTube channel. Um, just give us 24 to 48 hours to upload the recording and it'll be available for your review. We also have a few live polling questions uh, that will be coming up on the screen throughout the presentation. So feel free to uh, keep an eye out for those so you can participate and hear, have your voice heard. Now, as I mentioned, we do want to take all of your questions. Anything you have related to allergens, food safety, PJR, safe food and root, no topic is off limits uh, within the bounds of if you can stump our panelists. <laughs> but just go ahead. If you have a question, you can open the question tab on the control panel that should be on your screen. It should look something like this. There will be a space down there for you to type your questions in. Click the send button at the bottom, and that will come in on our side for us to get it answered for you. And as I also mentioned, polling questions. We are going to employ this about four times, I think, throughout the presentation. This is just to get a better gauge of the audience and what we're working with today. Um, first question is, let us know, let us know about you. <laughs> you know, what's your current role in your company? There'll be five options up on your screen. Just choose the one that suits you best. And that should be coming right up on your screen now. We'll give it a, a good little, little 30 seconds or so. So, you know. Buzz in on your phones now, attendees. And while that's going on, um, as I see more people joining, I did just want to remind you all um, that this is being recorded. So as those, you'll also have that Q&A at the end uh, for future review. All right, we're seeing lots of FSQ manager responses here in the poll. We'll give this another couple of seconds to get those answers in. All right. Thank you all so much for responding. And here's what our breakdown looks like. Welcome everyone. You know, we appreciate everyone who takes the time to attend uh, these webinars. We really do hope it'll be useful for you. All right, but without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead now and pass things over to our special guest speaker, Jen Crandall. Jen, uh, it's all yours if you wanna go ahead. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, your kind introduction, and um, thank you to the Perry Johnson Companies for hosting me today. Uh, as Amy said, uh, my name is Jennifer Crandall. I am uh, the CEO and founder of Safe Food and Root. Um, a quick history of myself so they understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I have a food science degree, a degree from Purdue University, and I've spent the last 25 years in the food industry. Uh, becoming an expert in supplier compliance management and the food safety processes that are around it. Just over half of my career has been at the corporate offices of Kroger uh, Corporate, helping them with their food safety compliance of their private label sector of their vendors. In 2018, I veered away from the corporate life and founded Safe Food and Root, which is the food safety consulting agency uh, and we focus on making corporate level food safety programs accessible to small and medium sized businesses, as well as large businesses, but our main focus and marketing drive is towards small and mid size. Um, I've also contributed to Dr. Darren Detweiler's 2021 published book uh, called Building the, food safety, uh, the Future of Food Safety Technology, Blockchain and Beyond. Um, that I, in that book, I discussed uh, in one chapter a lot about the things to consider from the user perspective of all documentation that needs to be digitized. Uh, I'm also a regular guest lecturer at Purdue University, Cincinnati State University, and Fresno State University. 
Uh, my passion right now is bringing to food businesses the support that I felt when I was in a corporately managed food facility. So you notice a lot of the eight years of manufacturing experience that I had, uh, a lot of that time was supported by large corporate programs. And so uh, that's my passion. I wanna make sure that the small and medium sized companies have that kind of support as well, because I've also worked in private sector and recognized I did not have the same level of support. And so um, that is that is my end goal, is to make sure that you all feel that way as well. Um, so without further ado, I wanna pass it on to Chris Reno and have him do an introduction of himself as well. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer, so much. Um, I always love seeing, you know, your your background and history and the things that you've accomplished in the industry. So my um, background is is drastically different. I actually graduated from the University of Arkansas with a focus and emphasis in supply chain. Um, however, after that, I actually got into uh, restaurant ownership and spent really the next, you know, 10 to 15 years working in restaurants, selling food to restaurants, and then eventually became a manufacturing rep. Um, during that time, I actually had a, a son. My wife and I were blessed with a baby boy, and he had a food allergy. So while I was working on the manufacturing side of things, I, I started to dive really deeply in my personal time, um, all things food safety. And that, you know, of course, leads you down all sorts of rabbit holes, especially in dealing with allergens and recalls. So today's webinar is very near and dear to my heart, just like I, I assume it will be to some of our audience today. So uh, thank you again. I'll be in the background throughout the presentation and then jump back in for questions at the end um, related to certification or any questions that maybe we can answer uh, from the food safety team. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, so let's let's start first with why are we talking about allergens? Um, as many of the, pan the people that are on the webinar a good portion of you are food safety quality managers and experts. Um, so you probably have a passion around this topic as well. Um, but let's let's spend a day in the life of a, an allergic child's parent. And similar to Chris's story with his family, people are not that aware of the complexity that allergens bring to a family until one or more allergens affect them personally. So uh, I'm gonna share a story that was recently shared with me. I, I hear about these types of stories all the time as I'm sure a lot of the experts on this call do as well. Um, so just kind of taking some of the other people that are in other roles down the, the path. So a mom, uh, a friend of ours, a mom wanted to buy a king cake to celebrate Fat Tuesday during Mardi Gras. Uh, and so she was gonna buy that from the grocery store she read the label and nothing was mentioned regarding nuts, which is good because she has a child at home that's severely allergic to pecans. Uh, there was no mention on the label that the product was produced in a facility that has pecans or any other type of nuts. So she decided to buy the cake based on what she read on the label. And then because of experience, uh, she just had an instinct to further check with the manufacturer. And after a closer review of the label, she saw the cake was distributed by uh, the grocery store and not actually manufactured by them. When she started digging, she realized that the grocery store decorated the cake. So they applied the icing on the cake and they did the decorations, but they did not actually manufacture the cake there. So naturally she just wanted to be sure that there were no concerns for her child. So she called customer service and asked for more information but they had to do some research and said they would call her back. So meanwhile, she hid the cake in her pantry in a place that she felt like her child would not look because she didn't want them to be tempted to eat it before knowing for sure. Customer service contacted her back, but it took them two days to get back to her. Um, and they did let her know that the cake was actually produced in a facility that also handles tree nuts, including pecans. So at that point, the lady, uh, the, our friend, she made the decision and other plans for her child for their sweet treat that day. Um, and luckily it was before Fat Tuesday still, so she could you know, convert her plan or divert her plans and, and get something set up for them. It might not seem like a big deal, but that actually is a difficult position for a parent to be, as you can imagine. I mean, what would you do in that circumstance if you have a severely allergic child at home 
and you found out that the product was produced in a facility that also manufactures things with the allergy. So I know it's a common topic on Perry Johnson webinar circuit, um, but I wanted to make it a little bit more personal for, uh, for you. And because our audience is a blend, a blend of uh, food safety quality and administrative leadership, um, I wanted to make sure that we also cover some of the basics of allergens first. So we're gonna talk about what are allergens, um, what the law says about allergens, why are they still number one for recalls, um, even as recent as 2022? Uh, in the U.S. at least, um, and then, you know, where are they introduced? How are they being managed? Um, and then how to react when the law changes? So those are some of the things that we're going to cover throughout the, the presentation. Uh, allergens can be really simple, but they can get really complex depending on the type of raw materials that are used in the facility. All right, so a little bit more, um, what are allergens? So Let's talk first about definitions so that we can set the stage of why the FDA has identified certain foods as allergies versus others. And, and this is based on FDA, but keep in mind that if there are other people in the audience from other areas, um, this also is a lot of the grounds for why regulatory agencies require management of them. So Food allergens is one definition versus food intolerance and sensitivities, because when you're talking to people, uh, they use them interchangeably sometimes. So it's really important to understand the difference. So according to the FDA, and I'm just gonna read it right off the slide so you can read with me. The definition of food allergies is when the body's immune system reacts to certain proteins in food. And the FDA also mentions that the reactions can include mild hives, lip swelling to severe life-threatening symptoms, including death, where the difference in a food intolerance and sen sensitivity I found on the Cleveland Clinic website, they define it as food tolerance and uh, sensitivity as being when your body has a hard time digesting a food. Uh, they also mention non-life-threatening symptoms such as an upset stomach or digestive-related issues after a few hours of consumption. So not quite as severe. Um, if you're interested in looking a little bit more into uh, the differences between the two, you can read, um, you can grab those web links at the bottom of this slide, and I believe it'll be shared at the end of this presentation as well. Um, you can uh, click on those links and learn more about it. So. That's the differences between the two and why regulatory focuses on preventing death, preventing life-threatening symptoms, where food sensitivities, there's a lot of different food sensitivities uh, that come up uh, regularly, but they do not cause that life-threatening symptom. So it's hard to track. It's not always reportable to uh, the different regulatory agencies. All right, so let's go into the U.S. regulations. I'm going to assume most of the attendees today are based on uh, in the U.S. or they're importing into the U.S. So I want to start here. This is not going to encompass all of the international laws, but I will give you some direction towards them. Uh, so there are nine allergens, the big nine as we now uh, call it. So milk, peanuts, tree nuts, which are treated separately. So pecans are treated separately than hazelnuts, than cashews, than Brazil nuts. Um, and then you have shellfish and fish. Also, each species of those are treated separately. So uh, fish being cod, trout, salmon, tuna, they're all treated separately as separate allergens. And shellfish, uh, you might have um, Oddly enough, I just learned uh, octopus are, is considered a shellfish, uh, clams, uh, anything in the mollusk bivalve family, lobster, shrimp, um, any of those types. So those are all treated separately. Um, and then you also have wheat, peanuts, eggs, soy, and sesame. And if you're familiar with uh, US law, then uh, you probably are familiar that sesame was just recently added to the list. So we went from big eight to big nine. Um, that was added recently um, in 2021 to the list after the FASTER Act of 2021 was signed into law by President Biden. Um, and what that law did was allowed for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services 
to report on research opportunities for prevention, treatment, and potential cures for, aller for food allergies. Um, and it also developed a scientific framework for adding additional allergens to the top nine in the future if warranted. Um, so labeling of sesame and making an emphasis on labels was required as of January 1st of this year. So all labels needed to highlight that going into January 1st. Um, this law, it only covers the U.S. So um, again, mentioning that the, I'm, I'm very focused on the U.S. on this slide. Um, and that the FDA regulated product only. So it does not cover other categories of food, uh, including meat, poultry, egg products, uh, anything regulated by the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, um, and any raw agricultural commodities such as fresh fruit and vegetables. And it also, I, this is really important to mention and we'll, we'll touch on it in a later slide, it does not include most foods sold without a label in a restaurant environment. Um, sesame was already recognized by various other countries across the globe and advocacy and consumer groups were pushing for it to be added to the list of the U.S. major allergens. It could not happen until the U.S. signed that FASTER Act of 2021 into effect. And so um, that this FASTER Act gives us, basically it's giving the regulatory agencies a way to one, trend the data, and notice if anything new is coming up that's becoming more of an alarming uh, you know, level of allergen where more of the population is affected by it. And then two, giving them the right to add it to the list and put laws into effect around it so that we can keep moving forward. Okay, so uh, as international laws uh, in, in other countries, I'm gonna give you a resource and you'll notice this is the uh, Food Allergens International Regulatory Chart. It's by University of uh, Nebraska, and it's uh, the Food Allergy Research and Resource Program. A lot of us call it FARP, F-A-R-R-P. Um, this is a fantastic resource to look up, and you can click on each country. It's a very interactive map. You can click on the countries, and it will show you what type of allergens are required by law to be managed there in those countries. So many countries have a lot of other allergens where we have big nine, I believe Canada has uh, 14 or 15 now. Um, some of these, and this is not limited, uh, include corn, gluten, mustard, and celery. So you'll see variances in other countries. Um, the biggest thing is to start here, but if you are creating labels and you're importing into other countries, be sure that you are making sure that you meet the local legal requirements to wherever you're importing. But this is a great starting point to determine what allergens do I need to be controlling. Um, it's not just labels, so I do wanna be clear. It's also control and management of it in your facility. And that's where I wanna bring up um, another, because sesame was a hot topic in uh, 2021. And so some of you, I know it's been brought up on uh, previous webinars and maybe some of the questions about a law called Natasha's Law. So Natasha's Law, the history of it um, was that there was a, a girl named Natasha Ednan Laperhouse. Uh, she passed away, unfortunately, uh, suffering from a severe allergic reaction to sesame while on board a flight originating out of the Heathrow Airport. Um, the, the story is she purchased a baguette with sesame seeds baked into the bread from a local store in the airport and then uh, sesame was not called out on the label. It was not declared on the label. So it was kind of like in a prepared meals section, just a sandwich that she grabbed up. She did from the story I've been told, and I, I don't have this verified, I do believe I read it in the news around that time, that she tried to ask if there was sesame in it. And, and the person on there looked at the label with her and they decided it, that it didn't. Um, so because of that, she was unaware and experienced um, a, a life-threatening situation that ultimately she passed away because of it while on the plane. So her parents worked on legislation changes. 
um, and they worked with uh, UK Secretary of State for the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs to change the law so that they put stricter allergen labeling requirements across the UK. And that went into effect in 2021 as well. So it was like parallel going on with our FASTER Act of 2021. Uh, at the same time, it was in effect, uh, the Natasha's law was going into effect in the UK. Um, this law is uh, centered around making sure that prepackaged foods for direct sale are included in the label laws. So they have, sandwiches, ready meals, hot food sections, and bakery products. So it's it's important that we talk a little bit about that. As I mentioned, restaurants still do not have to um, abide by the label laws for allergens. So it's really important whenever you're going into a restaurant to still ask questions. Even in UK, based on what I'm reading here, and what I understand of that law, you still need to ask if you are buying a meal from a restaurant, but they should have on their prepackaged foods now in the UK, uh, all of the information that you need to be able to understand what allergens are on there. Okay, so I believe we're up for another poll question and I will flip it back over to Amy to take over the reins so she can set that up for you. Absolutely. Let me go ahead and put that up on the screen for you guys. This one's a fairly simple question. And that's just how many allergens do you handle in the facility where you work? Um, obviously, we've got the, the obviously zero answer all the way up through more than 10. So go ahead and get those uh, responses in while we've got it up on the screen. And I'm going to go ahead and remind everyone, since we've had some new people join in, um, we absolutely want to answer your questions. So go ahead and uh, open the question tab on the control panel and type those questions in. You do not have to wait until the end to ask a question. You know, even if we answer it through the slides, uh, you know, maybe we can spark some more discussion at the end with your question. Um, I'm seeing some good responses here, so I'll give you a couple more seconds to get those answers in. All right, thank you all so much. And here's how that shook out uh, answer-wise, uh, Jen. So I'm gonna hand it back to you. All right. And let's keep going. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, all right, let me get the next slide over. There we go. Okay, so even with these laws in effect, we still have recalls associated with allergens. And you don't have to look very far to find a recall you know, due to an allergy alert. So I pulled this information out of the Food Safety News article that was just published on March 15th of 2023. And that out of 423 recalls that happened in 2022, 43.5% of them were in the US were related to allergens. And I do wanna preface that this is according to the FDA jurisdiction, so it did not include uh, any of the products that fall outside of FDA jurisdiction, but 43.5% were still related to allergens, and allergens are still the number one reason for recalls of foods managed by the FDA, reigning for the last five years, which uh, to me is just uh, a, a sad note. So, I wanna do a little bit of discussion uh, now to just kind of talk about stats and uh, the cost of a recall. Um, so we're gonna do an exercise about the cost of it. So I'm gonna set up a chart and give you a little bit of data that's out of that so that you can see visually what that article was saying. So in 2021, there were 52.1 million recalled units compared to 416.9, nearly 416 million units of product recalled in 2022. That's an astronomical change. Um, also the average size of a recall, so this is the number of units that were recalled average across those 423 recalls in 2022, and I don't know the number offhand for the 2021, but the average size was 125,796 units. So almost 126,000 units of product average on every recall that they had, that they encountered. And in 2022, that rose to 986,000 units nearly. So and just, again, a huge shift. So, you know, what happened? Why are we seeing so much? That's an interesting 
question to dive into that I know the experts are looking into, but just a tremendous amount of product and numbers on the units of recalled and the average size. So uh, what I wanna do is a little bit of math, which um, if anybody talks to me and knows me well, they all know I say I don't do math. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a food scientist, I don't do math. Um, and, and all jokes aside though, what is the cost of a recall? Has uh, a lot of people uh, have mentioned in my past history in Kroger corporate days, we used to require a certain number of um, like dollar value you had to hold on insurance policies for recalls. And it was a, a long time ago, I'm like I'm early in my career, it was like a million dollars and it moved to $2 million for insurance. And I'm not sure what everybody's getting requested to, to hold now in their insurance policies, but recently I started hearing that the average cost of a recall can be around $10 million, uh, and that has shifted. Uh, when you look at those numbers, though, from 2022, you can kind of understand it. So again, I'm gonna do a little bit of math. Um, I'm, this is all hypothetical, so I wanna make sure that I'm very clear and give that disclaimer. This is very hypothetical, but it is using actual data and actual uh, like numbers and units from the averages of 2022. So I'm gonna use the number of units that were in the average recall during 2022. I am also going to use three products categories that were mentioned. So you'll see some numbers reflect, but that is not the exact information of the recall. So I just wanna make sure I say that disclaimer up front. Um, so, and also on this exercise for math, I'm only going to calculate lost sales impact. So not, I'm not gonna include all of the other costs, okay? So one of the first ones that was mentioned was salad kits. And so what I did is I went to Walmart's online website and I pulled the retail cost for one salad kit. I just picked one randomly. It was $3.99 for a 34 .6 ounce bag. So that included some other components in it. Um, that equaled, when I multiplied the number of units times that retail cost, so that 986,000 nearly units times $3.99, that is $3.9 million in lost sales. That's hefty. Another item was Similac infant formula. So uh, you might see that there's still a lot of activity, even Frank Giannis was on, um, uh, giving testimony yesterday about the Similac infant formula uh, recalls that happened with Chronobacter uh, bacteria. Um, that uh, hit what he was working on, even though it's not allergen related, I still wanted to use it just so that we could see impact. So one can that's 30.8 ounces cost on Walmart's website, $32.54. This was as recent as last week. And when I calculated that through the number of units, it was $32 million in lost sales. And then the last one I did was Jif peanut butter because that one was also included in, uh, mentioned in the article. So these are just three items that were mentioned in the article, three categories. Um, it was $6.78 for a 40 ounce jar. And that was $6.7 million in lost sales when you calculate it through 986 thousand. Again, this is just the lost sales, nothing else. When you do a recall, you have so many other components. So, you know, just kind of giving perspective, last year there were 423 recalls, 181 of them was 43 and a half percent. That's how many recalls were related to allergens. I don't know the number of units, but when you do the total units, you're, you're, adding up quickly. You also have wasted food, wasted raw materials. So you used all these raw materials and now they're they're gone. You don't have any more left and um, that's all gone. Um, you have wasted fuel and energy for shipping them, for storing them, uh, sending them to other places and having them stored. Uh, there's all kinds of costs that are associated with that. The electricity to manage it, labor costs, 
this uh, this pie chart is not all inclusive so i do want to be clear like there's probably a lot more costs associated but just trying to impact get that point uh impactful uh so labor costs of managing it wasted packaging think about all the core good that went to waste in those recalls that is not part of the finished product but is part of the cases that are shipped to them and all that you could have used that in other areas legal fees and then any administrative fees lost sales uh you know i mentioned the lost sales and that sort of thing but there's so much cost it's easy to see even with one skew how quickly that can add up to 10 million dollars so it's really important that we understand how to control these things so with that um yeah I'm going and yeah, I'm sorry, Jen. I just wanted to jump in really quickly because while I, I agree that you know there's probably some pieces of the pie that aren't in here, um, I think one of the things that I, I always think about the most, again, as a parent of a child with the allergy, with an allergy, is the reputational risk of the brand. Yes. You yes. know, it's it's really difficult for me to plus put my trust back into a brand after a massive recall that you know maybe wasn't handled the best or maybe just you know was unfortunate circumstances with something that was undeclared that led to public health and you know safety i'm Absolutely. not going to buy that product again and that's the way that a lot of the consumer base in this in this sector really feel so i think that you know all of these costs are very tangible fixed costs that you can you know do the math in your facility yourself in your mock exercise, but what is that undeclared cost of your brand's reputation? So good. That's a great point. And thank you for highlighting that, Chris. I mean, uh, the reputational risk of just having a recall, the impact of that is uh, astronomical when it comes to like, if you are a newer company getting started and you lose your consumer base, because you had a recall that impacted them severely, that's already reputational risk. And then from the, you know, the sector of just selling it into retail stores and that customer that's going to be selling it as retail or that customer that's gonna be selling it through the wholesale market, those customers also, you lose your reputation with them. And so that could completely change the trajectory of the growth of your company. Um, very, like within a dime, on a dime. And you think there's so many companies that cannot afford to go through. I mean, imagine like the cost of a $10 million recall can kill a company because that company may not even be making $10 million a year yet. So um, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's so much impact. Lose your customer base, lose your consumer base, and then you're probably losing a lot more as well. And, and well, I want to, you, you know, yeah. you also have the ramifications that if you know the recall is not handled properly, um, you know, there's there's penalties that could even wind, you know, put you in jail. As we've Absolutely. seen in the past with gross negligence, you know, it's now becoming something that's also a very prosecutable offense. So Absolutely. you know, that's very rare, but it, it is something to be aware of. Well, and the FDA has that authority now with the Food Safety Modernization Act. They have the authority to, um, it's criminal penalties along with uh, prosecuting for fines. And so there's there's a lot more at stake than there used to be uh, from the FDA and from the consumer side of it. So great, great points, Chris. Thank you for chiming in. Um, on that note, I do want to just kind of reiterate the how important it is that we are doing mock recalls. So um, it's not just about allergen, this is about food safety management and your processes. How prepared are you if something happens? So when, uh, I'm gonna turn it back to Amy to do a quick uh, poll again to ask you about your timing on the last mock recall that you did in your facility. Absolutely. Here we go. Let me throw it right up on your screens here. And we do also have the option of never as well, in addition to those that were on the previous slide. Um, and I will say I have seen a couple of questions come in. Keep them coming. Um, like I said, there's not uh, any requirement that you wait until the end. So if you think of something, shoot the question over before you forget the question. <laughs> All right. We'll give this a couple more seconds for a response on the question on the screen. 
and we'll go from there. All right, we're at a good 55% response. So let me go ahead and put the results up on the screen for you guys. It looks like it's a pretty solid, uh, at least within the last six months, says the majority. Right back over to you, Jen. All right, thank you so much. And apologies, the, the trash guy's going through, so now my dog's gonna bark. So in case you hear background barking, uh, <laughs> just the nature of the beast anymore. All right, so like I said before, um, you don't have to look very hard to find another allergen-related event. This is straight off the FDA dashboard uh, for recent allergens. So all I did was re uh, look for any type of allergen-related recall. This one was re as recent as February. Pilgrim's Roasted Nuts uh, issued an allergy alert on products due to undeclared milk, soy, and walnuts. Um, according to this company announcement, when I dove into it, there were seven products that were recalled with either undeclared milk, soy, or walnut, or a combination of the three. Um, and the statement on the FDA website said this was a voluntary recall. So they were not aware of any reported cases of illnesses um, related to the date. But I use this as an example, and again, you kind of go back to 43.5% of 2022's FDA recalls were related to allergens. So, so what is going on? In today's FDA mandated process, is why are we still seeing this happen? And better yet, what can we do to stop it? So I'm gonna go through uh, you know, understanding how allergens can get introduced into your food system um, and trying to uh, just kind of dissect it a little bit. So my team and I came up with a list of 10 ways. Uh, this is not all inclusive, but it's a good introduction to thinking through your systems and what types of ways allergens can get introduced into it. Um, and keep in mind, this is also, uh, you know, kind of unintentional introduction. So we're not talking about introduction to the system due to formulation. So that's another component that's not mentioned on this list. So first off, raw materials. Um, they can be improperly labeled. Uh, sometimes specifications are not updated regularly uh, from your suppliers or the label isn't, and that, that can lead to a failure. Um, another one is, uh, I'm sure everybody that's in the food safety quality space understands this, that it can be improper sanitation. So where a product with an allergen is being produced and sanitation was not adequate to remove the allergen resid res residues uh, from the equipment and cross contact occurs with a non-allergen containing product. Um, another way, employees and human error. Sometimes employees just do not follow GMPs, uh, good, the good manufacturing practices, sometimes uh, just procedures they're not following, they're not paying attention, they're having a bad day. Um, very, uh, there's examples of this, like any of us probably have stories of it, um, but examples of this could be that they're carrying an allergen containing food into the production area. Um, they might have improper handling of allergen containing foods already. Maybe it's the staging, improper staging, uh, poor sanitation execution, just not following procedures regarding the verification of sanitation. There's so many different examples that we could pull from. Um, training and well-written SOPs, standard operating procedures are key. However, we just have to be real that people make mistakes. It happens. And so we wanna make sure that we're prepared if that does. Mislabeled products can be another way that we see uh, introduction of allergens into systems. So, this occurs when an old label might be applied to a product or a changeover might have been conducted without labels fully cleared out. Um, you know, it, like maybe you have an old label version and you've updated the spec, you've updated the formula, but that old formula does not have, uh, a, like doesn't have that allergen listed on the label. So that can be a, a way that mislabeled products happen. Airborne and dusting, um, airborne allergens, uh, that could be 
you know, they can get into an area, maybe a good example of this would be like milk powder being dumped into a formula where a line nearby is running and that formula does not have milk in it. So some the milk powder ends up in the product next to it. Um, sanitation, oh, I'm sorry, mechanical failures and lack of prevention, uh, preventative maintenance, so PMs. Um, equipment fails. So just like people have bad days, equipment does too. Um, you need to be regularly checking that equipment is in good condition and all of the parts that need replaced on a regular rotation are being done. Uh, that is supported by the manufacturer of the equipment. It's really critical to follow manufacturer guidance um, to, to keep from failures but they still happen. And a lot of times what we see when we have a mechanical failure, you might see uh, foreign material. A lot of people see foreign material in it. So we hear about recalls related to metal shavings, gaskets, pump parts, just a lot of different things related to, to that kind of failure. Um, but it also can cause a nut to get trapped in a line or um, an improper sanitation to happen. So that all can impact what's going on there. Improper product changeovers. Um, this could be, um, this might look like uh, you have a, a changeover going on and you have a, a good example I've, I use for my past history, like vanilla ice cream, and you're changing over to an ice cream that has an allergen in it. So maybe you're sh shifting over to butter pecan and the vanilla is, all of the vanilla is out, but they didn't uh, get the labels out of it, the, the packaging out of the system. So you have a few vanilla packaging pieces still in the equipment. And the next thing you know, you've got butter pecan in vanilla labeled ice cream. And so you might have that improper changeover there. Another way, it's different than sanitation, uh, but you could have improper changeover where you don't push out the allergen. So say you're running pecan, better pecan, and then you're going to switch to another allergen containing product that does not have pecan in it. So maybe you're going from butter pecan to one that we used to call like tin roof sundae, which had peanuts in it. And you would push out all of the butter pecan out and then make sure that you get shifted over to tin roof sundae. That's probably not something that uh, scheduling does anymore, but it's just something to keep in mind mislabeled ingredients. So this is where, uh, you know, I mentioned before raw materials coming in and they don't have the specs updated um, or they might have the label incorrect. And so then your label doesn't reflect allergens, but it also could be that your supplier has a failure at their facility. Um, so that might end up causing a mislabeled ingredient to come into your facility as well. Similar problems, similar th things. And, that's why it's important to understand your supplier programs and how they manage everything. Improper storage. Uh, this might look like in the warehouse, allergens stacked over the top of non-allergen containing ingredients or over packaging. Uh, maybe you have improper staging where you have partial bags that are stored near things that are not allergen related. So that could be a way that introduction happens. And then uh, finally, I said there were 10, this again, not all inclusive, but a good example of different areas that it can happen. Um, so new equipment. So let's say you have no changes in raw materials, but you've introduced new equipment to your process and there might be new trapping points for your existing products that were not there in the previous equipment. So it's just really important to understand all the hazards. This all kind of goes back to uh, conducting hazard analysis and going into your food safety plans a little bit more. So HACCP food safety plans, these help us prepare, but these are things that you can look at to see where can allergens get introduced into my processes. All right, so before I go to the next one, I think, yep, I have another uh, question about your allergen plans, and I'll let Amy take it over for the poll question. Yep, and this one is a little bit different just because the the responses are were a little too long to fit in the polling question themselves. <laughs> so take in what you can see on your screen here for all four of them because they won't have the full description of what each implies on the actual selection screen. 
So I'm going to throw this up on the screen and I will read through all of them just in case. So first response, how robust are your allergen programs today? Very, very robust. We have a lot of procedures in place to prevent cross contact. Uh, second choice, moderate. We have a good framework put together, but it could use some assistance taking it to the next level. Third option, could use some work. You know, the programs exist, but you know, maybe you're watching the webinar today and you're realizing you don't have as solid a system as you thought you might. And then your, your last option, help. We have no program. Uh, you know, we didn't realize this was such a serious issue and we need some assistance. So go ahead and get those responses in. We're looking at almost 60% already. We'll give it a few more seconds. And there have been a ton of questions coming into the questions box. Thank you so much for those who have sent those in. Um, hopefully we'll have enough time to get to all of them, but if not, um, there will be contact information both for Safe Food on route en route and uh, PGRFSI on the last slide as well. So if you have further questions, you will be able to send them our way for an answer. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll now. And this is how you all responded. So thank you to all who did who did participate in this question. Yeah, and I'm gonna hand things back to John. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. And I'll try to wrap it up so that we have enough time to um, get through those questions. Um, so new law, comes into effect, the sesame comes into effect, and now we have to manage that. Uh, or we have a new allergen that we've added to our food system. What, what do we do? What do we need to do in order to get to that next stage where we're, we're controlling it? So again, uh, you know, we kind of put together a general list to kind of combine, uh, and, and this is very general, <laughs> so I would just want to be clear, like this is this is not, we would do a lot more robust in consulting to this, uh, but giving you an idea of where to, where to even think about beginning uh, with those changes. So the first thing is you need to review your raw material list and the labels. So this needs to be done regularly anyway, and it needs to be part of, like done as your hazard analysis and your HACCP plans or your food safety plans but it also should just be done as part of a procedure as well. So something to consider is, can this be added to your receiving procedure where your receiver gets a copy of the label or they're looking at the label and they're comparing it to what you're expecting to come in and making sure there are no variances. So things like that would uh, give you regular review while you're still running and it be part of your processes. Another thing to do is review your finished labels, uh, your finished product labels. So as I mentioned before, sometimes you have updated labels and that uh, you maybe you accidentally, your, your stager pulled the old labels. So it's good to constantly be checking to make sure that your finished product labels do reflect the product that you are producing and the specs that are up to date now. Once you've done that, you need to adjust your hazard analysis and your HACCP or your food safety plans to include several different things. Um, so just kind of factoring in, it's not, uh, it's including things that are in your prerequisite programs or part of your current GMP. So things like your sanitation SOPs, the storage of the product, your color coding of your uh, standard operating procedures for color coding. So many people, uh, now it's it's written into a lot of the programs that you need to have some type of color coding for labeling, for uh, equipment, for sanitation, for your allergen program. So if you manage three different allergens, you need three different colors to show that those are separate from everything else so that you're keeping them isolated. Pre-operational swabbing, so using swabbing as a way to verify that you have gotten all the residue off of your equipment. Um, another thing that was mentioned to me uh, recently, and I thought this was a great idea, one of my team members said, you know, invest in good flashlights because you can really see if you are as clean as you think you are just from a visual inspection and having a nice flashlight that gets into those dark crevices to see did those crevices actually get clean in your equipment um, and do that as part of on ice cream and happen as much anymore but the more variety you have in SKUs and different formulations that could be a situation where you don't have enough time in the day to run things without having a little bit of a allergen cleanup in between 
production and not doing a full sanitation. So understanding that order is important. And then your verification procedure. So those pre-op swabs that I mentioned, um, but also making sure that you are validating that that is sufficient. So verification and validation going into your HACCP, your food safety plans, your scientific backing that you are doing the right things. Uh, and then I did mention receiving procedures prior. Uh, so just incorporating some of these activities into whatever procedures you can so that not just the food safety quality team is owning the process, but that other departments are owning the process. Share the load so that you can have a little bit more um, access to making sure you're not getting new allergens into your processes and that you are producing what you say you're producing. And then last, it's a little hard to see with the black band, but um, update your allergen program. So just updating your policy after you've gone through a thorough review, you need to make sure you update your allergen policy as well. Things not to do, and I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that, especially with sesame, with the new sesame law, I think it's important to understand um, you, you need to, don't change all the formulas to include this new allergen. That's not the right method. That is like a last resort method. Instead, um, and I use bakery as an example because bakery has wheat in everything, uh, usually, uh, unless they have products that they're trying to make that they're claiming no wheat in or they're doing a gluten-free or something. But many bakeries would have all wheat in it. And the temptation is that you throw a little bit of sesame seed into the formula that way you don't have to control it and you just call it out on all labels. That's costly just the same because changing a label and changing all your packaging costs money. It's important to try to manage and adjust your programs to manage those hazards first. So do not skip your hazard analysis when you're buying a product, uh, when you're approving new raw materials or suppliers, when you're using any of the products. Uh, do not skip that hazard analysis before you do that. And then third, do not assume that all vendors have updated you on spec and label changes. That's why you need to keep a close eye on them. So in summary, um, allergen management is part of your food safety culture. So a buzz phrase right now is food safety culture. Allergen management is part of this. That means that everyone is empowered to protect the safety of the food, not just the food safety quality team. It also means that everyone understands their impact on food safety and how it impacts the food safety of your finished product and sharing that load. So like I mentioned before, share the load together. Don't put all of that on the food safety quality team or the manager themselves. And bring the team together when you're doing uh, decisions, when you're making decisions. So if it's construction, if it is uh, buying new equipment, if it is buying new product, if it is just changing formulations, it's important to bring in the right team. It's important to bring in the food safety quality team early because they see things differently. And a lot of times they're brought in last minute and the other thing is it's encouraged to bring in outside experts and resources as well. So bringing in that consultant or a company that from your, you know, some of your vendors, maybe you bring in a vendor to the discussion, um, have them as part of the discussion because you grow bias to your own processes and to your own facility and you miss things. And it's okay to utilize other team, uh, other people as part of the team. So sometimes that might look like your HACCP team, your, you know, your team that, your food safety team, but it also should include those outside resources as well. I can't tell you how many times I've used my network to help me with decisions and those roles. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you because it sounded like there was enough questions to keep us busy for a little bit and we only have a few more minutes. So I'll turn it back to Amy. All uh, right, perfect. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put the combined contact info. Um, obviously, all of Jen's direct confo, co contact info is right here on your screen. But here's the info if you wanted to reach out to Chris or Pedro FSI, as well as Safe Food on Route uh, itself. But let me go ahead and scroll all the way back through the questions to the beginning. We'll go in order here. Um, and let's just jump right in. We've got a question here about FSVP scope. Um, for FSVP, FSVP scope, uh, what does the FDA expect the importer to evaluate uh, regarding the allergens contained in products? 
Oh, that's a great question. So FSVP, uh, basically when you're looking at uh, importing anything into the United States, you have to make sure that that product is meeting the regulatory requirements that would be expected of the domestic uh, manufacturer. So allergens need to be controlled. You need to be looking at their program to make sure that they are managing the U.S. called out allergens. So if, uh, if you're looking at it in a lot of countries, uh, so here's a great example, and this might be applicable to what your situation is. Uh, a lot of countries do not say that wheat is an allergen, they say gluten is an allergen. And that is a distinct difference in the US. We say wheat is. So we have to understand what is your gluten source? Is it corn or is it wheat? Or is it something else that I'm unaware of because technology keeps changing? Um, so you know, identifying what allergens they have in their facility or what allergens are they managing? Do they have proper controls in place and do they understand the US regulation? So that would be the direction I would uh, say to do for that. All right, uh, we've got a question here about uh, lychee nuts. Uh, since lychee nuts are considered to be tree nuts, um, if a product is made from lychee meat, not the seed inside, does the is the label required to declare uh, the lychee nut in the contained statement? Oh my goodness, that is way over, like honestly, I would have to research the lychee nut a little bit more. My, uh, the only thing that I'm aware of with different uh, distilling processes for oils. A lot of times uh, the way that we distill can uh, get the allergen content out of it. But based on what you're saying, my gut feeling is you would still have to declare it on the label because the nut meat is part of the uh, formula, but I may have misunderstood. So please feel free to reach out. We can, we can do a little bit more um, you know, investigation in that if you need more assistance. Absolutely. All right, let's see. We've got another question here. If th This is probably a good one. Um, if the allergen is already stated in the ingredient list, is it still required to declare it separately in the contains statement? Mm, so the allergen, the way that the U.S. requires uh, that we either bold it in the ingredient statement. So if it's in the ingredient statement, you have to bold it with its common name or it needs to be called out after on the label. Um, so right after the ingredient statement, you have to call out allergens and then list them out individually. So the lychee nut example, um, if you have it, uh, or let's, let's because I'm not as familiar with that, let's use sesame uh, since that one was a hot topic. Um, tahini has sesame in it, but the common name of sesame is not part of tahini. So some people may not know that tahini is made of sesame. So if tahini was on your ingredient statement, you would need to put in parentheses next to it and bold it sesame. Um, and then you would, uh, and any other ingredients that are in there, but you also, you, you either do that or you put it under the lab, under the ingredient statement saying sesame and bold as well. So uh, hopefully that didn't confuse you, but it's pretty easy to find the label laws on what the requirements are for the ingredient statement. All right, great. We've got a question here about uh, gluten-free products. Um, this person asks, uh, for gluten-free products, what is the quick checklist that manufacturers must be aware of? Oh, oh, that's a, a very specific. Um, well, I would always say as uh, the ingredients to make sure you understand what the gluten source is. Is it wheat or corn? Um, because gluten-free products in the U.S. is not, um, right now they're still uh, working on recommendations for that. Uh, they are, there are some label claims that you have to be careful with. So what claims are you making on the label? Uh, what processes do you have in place in your facility to control gluten? So understanding what ingredients have gluten in them, uh, be it corn, be it wheat, how are you managing that through your facility? A real, the, uh, BRC has a really great program uh, for gluten-free uh, that kind of does, uh, the framework of it is really based on HACCP principles. So treating it like your HACCP plan and identifying you know, throughout your ingredients, where is gluten introduced, part of your process, you know, where can you have potential breakdown and then how do you control it? And a lot of times the best way to control that is on your uh, receiving side, on your storage side and that sort of thing. But 
Yeah, and I'll jump in on this one yeah. from the certification body side of things. Sure. Um, like you mentioned, you know, BRC does have a wonderful gluten-free framework, you know, module built into it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a really great place to start looking for the checklist. Uh, that's something that you can actually, I believe, download a uh, small fee required from the BRC website if you just want to perform an internal assessment of yourself. Um, and then that way, if you've got any gaps, you know, that's something that we can help you with, that Jen and her team can help you with uh, to get you compliant, whether that's, you know, you're purchasing or you're a supplier supplying to, you know, your end user. Thanks for chiming in on there, Chris. Uh, we are yes. at our scheduled end time. However, there are so many great questions here that I am going to squeeze in a couple more if Jen is able to. Um, but if you do have to leave, I will remind you the recording of this entire broadcast will be posted to the PGRFSI YouTube channel free for review. So if you have to get to ne in your next meeting or your next scheduled activity, please feel free to just come back to our YouTube channel and review what you might have missed. Um, Jen, if you have time for a couple more, there are some really great questions here waiting oh, for sure. you. Um, yeah, we've got that's a question. Absolutely. Great, we've got a question about dairy-free and milk uh, allergens. What is the regulation for claims like dairy-free? Is it appropriate to remove the trace milk claim when I have dairy-free on the label? Oh, I'd have to dive into that a little bit more. Um, you, if you're making claims that it's dairy free and you have trace ingredients in there, uh, then to me, you shouldn't be making a claim. Um, I am very conservative on the way that I approach uh, label claims. So I'm always going to say that on the safe side, um, I would work on a way to get that trace amount out of your formula. All right, and similar to that that line of uh, response that you just mentioned, is there any guide or regulation that establishes set thresholds for the declaration of trace allergens? I feel like this came from one of my team members. We actually just talked about this yesterday. Um, there's a draft guidance that the FDA has put together uh, for uh, allergen amounts, but it is not very clear right now what the trace amounts allowable levels are. Um, and so the way that, you know, you do a lot of your processes, uh, it's either present or not present on swabbing. Uh, and a lot of the recommendations from our company would always, well, I know all the recommendations from our company would be present or not present. And if it is present, then it's there and you need to re-clean uh, in your approach. Or if it's in there in your formulation that you need to uh, you you need to claim it. It needs to be there. So I don't I don't know if that goes into enough depth for the person asking, but um, the the regulation is not clear yet on what's allowable and what's not. So it's always safe to go with not present. All right, fantastic. We've got a couple of questions here that I, I would feel would be more along the lines of basic questions regarding allergens that hopefully you can shed some light on. Um, the question here is, if the product is produced in a facility containing allergen, but there is no allergen ingredients in the product itself, do we have to declare the may contain allergen on the label? Cur uh, currently, no. Um, and in fact, uh, the way that the, the conservative side of that is if you're saying may contains, that's not absolving you from any liability that might be there if the allergen is found in the product. So, you know, I used the story earlier about the king cake and, uh, you know, pecan it being produced in a facility that has pecans in it. Um, if they would have put that on the label and the there was an allergic reaction to pecans, that would not have absolved them from uh, from being held liable for that. So you still have to have proper processes in place. One is separation, right? So a good way to do that is to make sure you have separation. Can you run it on two separate lines where the one that always has the allergen is ran on one line and the ones that don't have allergens are always ran on the other line? So that's that can be a good approach for managing it and keeping it in separate areas if there's potential dust uh, or anything like that. So that that's just well, one that's example. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, and, and not to mention just the uh, the production schedule of things. You know, king yeah. cake might be easier since it's a uh, you know produced really realistically once a year, right? For Mardi Gras, uh, there's some other nuanced type things where you know I talked to 
um, customers a lot where it's just like, listen, run this, you know, these particular days and completely eliminate, you know, a, a lot of that accidental contact, you know, accidental right. trace elements in the air. Um, that right. way, you know, you're not doing it, you know, just back to back all the time and, and, and opening yourself up to a lot more risk. Right. So the to the question, do you have to list it as may contains or produced in a facility of no, you don't have to list that. And if you are listing it, you basically it's it, it's still not absolving you from controlling it. So you still have to control it if you put that on the label. Um, so is it helpful information for an allergic uh, parent, you know, parent uh, or somebody who has an allergy? 100% it's helpful information, but it might cause them to not want to eat your product um, because the, of the severity of the allergen. So it's like it's kind of like a a brand decision, and it could put you in a situation where you're, you know, like you're still held liable for it whether you have it there or not. Hopefully that's helpful. I know that might have just added some confusion to it, Chris. You, I think you, the easiest way to say it is it's a business decision based on what's your risk versus reward in terms of, you know, costs. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of like in what not to do. Don't just automatically list it. Do everything you can to control it. All right. We have a sort of follow up question to that. Um, in the situation where may contain statements are not included on the label since it's voluntary, um, you know, if, for example, a product that did not have the may contain statement uh, through FDA sampling on the market, um, you know, it was discovered that it did contain the allergen um, since it's, you know, maybe it's not an ingredient, but it was in the facility. What would then happen regarding, you know, the, would there be FDA action? Um, is there a, a limit or a threshold, as we asked before, um, on what's found in the product? And will it just end up with a recall? You know, how could that play out? Yeah, all of those scenarios could play out that way. So you could have, um, and I, and I, like I said, I kind of tend to go conservative on things. So whenever I talk about what could happen, I'm more extreme because it's important to understand like this is the worst case scenario. But yes, you could have a recall. You could trigger a recall. You could have caused somebody to get sick. So it could be a full blown recall. Um, it could be um, the FDA prosecutes you. The uh, person who was injured uh, could also go after you in court so there's a i mean that's like the worst case scenarios um bottom line if you have product that has allergen residue in it it gives every regulatory authority and you don't have that on the label it gives every regulatory authority rights to to come after you all right we've got another really straightforward question here is coconut considered an allergen and what group would it fall under Yes, so in the United States, coconut isn't considered a tree nut. Um, other countries do not agree, so it's not uh, global. <laughs> so you have to keep an eye on that, uh, especially if you are importing product from other countries and they have coconut on it, they don't naturally add it to their labels. All right, um, we've got a question here about uh, warehouse requirements. Um, for warehouses handling completely sealed uh, product containers, do they need to have an allergen control plan in place? Any recommendations for such a plan if it's required? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, it's it's good to have allergen control in a warehouse, but if you're not opening, actively opening pro, um, packages and such, um, having just a basic handling process of like how you how do you manage your spillage and understanding the hazards that you have in your facility so that you can react appropriately um, if you the way that we talk about just in you know manufacturing that is handling allergens their warehouse storage is you know stack like over like so if it's possible in your rack system to to stack like over like then you know that you're introducing allergens only to products that have allergens. That way, if you accidentally tear a bag or a product you know, gets broken or something, that you can do your regular cleanup and then you don't have to like alert the supplier of the product underneath there and then have a, you know, put it on hold. You would still probably put it on hold to 
for other reasons, but you might be able to release it. So thinking of what your hold release program would be and what your uh, how you would manage spills would be my recommendation. All right, fantastic. Thank you to everyone who sent those questions and we are oh, 10 minutes great. past our scheduled end, so I'm going to wrap things up now. Um, any parting words of wisdom for the audience, Jen, before we uh, sign off here? Oh, <laughs> um, you know, no, I mean, call us if you need us. A lot, like I said, a lot of this is food safety culture. Um, and so if you need some assistance, it's never a bad thing to ask for help uh, to, you know, look at your programs. And I, I can't reiterate it enough how much everybody in your in your facility needs to be empowered and understand how allergens and food safety in general are impacted by their roles and if they if they if you feel like they don't have a clear understanding of it thinking start thinking about ways to incorporate that as part of their responsibilities if it's possible um, and you know the the people in the earlier poll uh, the very first poll i asked for the breakdown of everybody that was here you know, and we had uh, people from production, we have people that are in buyer planner positions, sales and business development and senior leadership. All of those groups are outside of food safety quality and those are just as impacted by food safety and allergen management as anyone else. So incorporate that into your uh, culture of your company and making sure that you have everybody managing their part. So that would, that would be my last parting words. Fantastic. I did go ahead and put the contact info for Jen and say food en route uh, right up on the screen here. So if you want to snap a picture, before, take a screenshot before <laughs> we wrap up, just so you have it on hand if you wanted to reach out. I do apologize. There were a few questions we did not have time to get to. If those are urgent to you, please do feel free to reach out. And I'm sure Jen uh, or someone in her team can get a response for you promptly. Um, but with that, I'm going to wrap things up for today. Thank you again so much to everyone who took the time to join us. Uh, Jen, always Always great having you on. Chris, thanks for chiming in with your thoughts as well. Um, I wanted to wish everyone a safe and happy rest of your week, and hopefully we'll see you on a future webinar. All right. Thank you so much. All great. Right, Thank you, you so soon. much, ladies. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye. -bye. Bye.